Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. Well, her immigrant parents actually met in a U.S. citizenship class, so perhaps it was fate that she's devoted her entire life to public service. I'm delighted to be joined today by Hilda Solis. She is the L.A. County Supervisor for District 1. So nice to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Well, you've had a remarkable career, and currently now you are serving the County of Los Angeles. Right. There's so many complicated issues in Los Angeles. I'm sure it almost pales. I mean, I'm sure the government <laughs> in D.C. almost paled in comparison to what's happening here. Um, but top of mind for everyone, of course, is homelessness. Yes. Um, I know you're very deeply involved in the County of Los Angeles Homeless Initiative. What exactly is that? What are the parameters there? Well, the Homeless Initiative came out of the whole Measure H which was passed several years back, almost seven years now, where the county actually asked our voters, the 10 million people that we represent, if they would help us uh, achieve some semblance of addressing this issue of homelessness. And so there was a, a tax, a measure, that allowed us to raise money, and that money goes every year towards helping to build out shelters, permanent, interim, as well as providing wraparound services. The, the Homeless Initiative helps us to better inform how we spend those money and how we consolidate and coordinate with all the 88 cities. So it goes well beyond the boundaries of the city of LA. But more importantly, how do we be begin to really address this so that we can actually get people off the streets into the kind of uh, permanent housing ultimately or services that they dramatically and, and it's necessary that they receive so that they survive, they can heal and they can receive the just dignity and respect that they need. Along with that, I, there's all of these conversations that people can participate in. There's scheduled community yes. conversations. So who should be invited, who is invited to these conversations, and how can people actually participate? And what are you hoping to learn from you know the constituency at you know it, it's really an exciting time because I think during the pandemic more importantly you know people may have felt like well how am I going to articulate or let people know what I'm experiencing as an unhoused person or if I'm a provider and I want to continue to do this work where do I go so that's what this convening is about through the the homeless initiative it's bringing together our partners our stakeholders our cities even places where you don't have a city where it's unincorporated like East LA, it's important to hear their voices and the different providers that help us in that effort. So LASA, the housing authority that goes out in the field and does outreach, coordinating with them, coordinating with cities, and then showing some of our, our leaders at the local level where funding is available. And if they have priorities in their neighborhoods or their cities, they can articulate that. We will look at it and it will then you know come back to us as recommendations. But I think it's a way to streamline the process. Process. And I think that's really critical because that's what we've heard over and over and over for many years, that uh, we have to be more nimble. We have to be able to use our money and have flexibility in changing whatever those priorities may be. I was actually, you almost answered, but I'm going to flesh out a little bit. You know, what are you hearing? So being nimble addressing the issue quickly. Yes, getting yeah. the money out and, and really setting some good expectations of what the county can and can't do. In part, um, I think there's this whole idea that somehow you can just move people off the street, put them somewhere and they're going to be okay. That's not necessarily how it it works. Ideally, that would be fine, but it doesn't work that way. You have to assess the individual, diagnose them, understand what their illnesses are, if they have any, and what those barriers have been. It could it could be a widow, a woman who lost her home because she doesn't have anyone to support her anymore. She's now on the street. She's been out on the streets now for maybe 10 years. And I've met people like that here in the city of LA and on Skid Row. And I know that um, it's important for us to understand where they are and to put almost put our, our feet in their shoes, so to speak, mm -hmm. and to understand how we can provide them the assistance that they need. And, and uh, I know that there are many people that are wanting to seek this help and there are many that are still resistant. So it takes time. It takes also uh, mental health teams, uh, treatment teams, physical uh, physicians, nurses, 
health practitioners who can also help us and do some of that work out on the street. And that's one of the things that I'm really excited about because now that I represent all of Skid Row, I represent all of it. Now, before I just had maybe a third of it, we're going to have a plan to address what is happening on Skid Row, working with the Women's Center, working with the providers there, working with our Department of Health, Department of Mental Health, uh, and all the services, including the city of LA. And we're going we're gonna to start to provide street medicine and treatment 20, 20, uh, 24 seven, so that people can come in say certain sections of the city, perhaps on Skid Row, close the street down and say, okay, you can come in, we're gonna help you with anything you need right now, medical attention, if you need uh, help with a bus pass maybe, or if you need to see a doctor, or if you need to get into a treatment facility, we're gonna be able to, how could I say, triage and provide that kind of support. And we're just starting right now that plan. Should have should have been happening a long time ago. I think it was on a piecemeal basis, but now we're saying, let's coordinate it so we can have greater impact and draw all that, all that resource and funding and monies, not just monies, but, but uh, professional clinical assistance to people who really need it on the street. Let me see if I understand what you're saying. Well, I do understand with redistricting, obviously now you have a broader yes. scope of, of Skid Row, et cetera. And I imagine that this is what you're talking about is the Skid Row action plan. Yes. Is it is it literally like pop-up triage yes. or is it going to be permanent in a specific space? Right now, uh, it's we envision it being pop-up because look at how many blocks are part of Skid Row, right? Sure. You're talking about a lot of people, maybe three to 4,000 people. So obviously, if if we can uh, begin to uh, address this on, on a, a micro level, I think we can start to make that healing process occur and leave the kind of, uh, I want to say, um, experience with people so that they can also talk to other folks and let them know, hey, this isn't a bad idea. Let's go over here. Let's get help. And when they do come in to your particular part of Skid Row, you'll kind of know what is happening. And we have involved already our, in one of our first meetings, kind of uh, draw, drawing from our stakeholders, our clinicians, our clinics, our health providers, and people who've been doing this for many more years than me, drawing on that expertise and saying, okay, let's now talk to each other. Let's sit at the same table and let's Let's, let's start to hear from the clients. Let's hear from them and see what it is that they want as well. Because I was thinking that there are a lot of great intentions. There are a lot of wonderful organizations. Yes. But the problem at large seems to be above the scope of all of these individual mm -hmm. efforts. So am I understanding that you are combining different, as you said, stakeholders? So all yes. these different organizations, both public and private, right. that are working in this area right. to work together? Yes, and philanthropic. And of course, some of those uh, providers are legacy providers. A women's uh, you know, downtown resource center for mm -hmm. on Skid Row has been there for many years. We're working with them just to identify how we can provide better treatment for women overall. And I think that uh, came out of a report that they actually brought to me and said, Hilda, supervisor, can you help us address this? So now we're going to put in about $4 million to address the issue of women living on Skid Row and doing it with people who know how to do this, right? So leads me to the next question of that, the initiative, the Every Woman Housed. Yes. Now that's something that you've been working on for a while. So this is sort of, you know, a more robust area, but how is that particular initiative going? How are you, you know, what you've seen so far. Is it moving in the right direction? I believe so, yes. And I know that we've already been able to house, uh, I, I want to say maybe 20 or more women since we started. And we want to do more. And obviously we are. And, and I think that's what maybe the public doesn't always quite understand because they look out in the street and they see people and they think, oh, it's not it's being getting, addressed. Yeah, it's getting well, worse. Well, the, getting pr worse, right? the problem is that we also have a, a high number of people that are continuing to fall in to uh, being homeless or unhoused. And, and we can't keep up with the rate. That's why we have to build more uh, permanent and uh, interim housing. And that's what we're going to be doing uh, along Skid Row on this, in the city of LA in partnership with them, as well as with other cities outside of the city boundaries. So for example, in Baldwin Park, the city of El Monte, we've uh, worked with the city managers and the city councils to acquire hotels, motels, and, and tiny homes as well. Mm -hmm. So these are exciting things that it took a while to get some of our cities engaged in, because this is a tough a tough uh, area to kind of break ground and say, you know, now we want cities 
other than just the city of LA to take some responsibility and some are doing it and some are learning and some still are a little hesitant to do it. Sure, the whole not in my backyard thing. Um, I'm gonna ask you something and I don't even know if there's an answer to this question, but you're talking about perception um, with your redistricting, obviously the quantity of homeless in mm -hmm. your district looked like it went up just because of the scope of where you are. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. but the, in, the, in the count, the, you know, the annual count, which finally got back up and going after the right. pandemic, you know, categories are broken down um, mm -hmm. as to chronic homelessness, mental ill, pro mental, those with mental illness, women, you know, mm -hmm. all, is right. there any kind of assessment cross assessment? Or, mm -hmm. Because I was wondering, mm -hmm. you know, you were talking about yeah. an area that is historically, um, right. you know, filled with the homeless or the unhoused. Um, but I was just wondering how all that data is used across, you know, whether we, oh, we need more facility for uh, drug rehabilitation right. because we're seeing more yes. of the chronically homeless are, you know, unfortunately addicted to drugs. I mean, are you, is that information oh, provided? Uh, yes, it is. And, and you're, you're absolutely right. We know that a majority of people that are unhoused and homeless um, suffer from some type of mental illness, but not all of them. Sure. Some are uh, addicted to, to uh, you know, drugs or, or substances that are harmful to them. And um, when you put that together, uh, that call requires a, a very hefty treatment plan. And depending on the severity of your mental illness, that might require you being in a special place that's more costly. Mm -hmm. So part in part, what we have seen is a neglect over time with the state and the federal government in providing additional support for counties and cities to be able to address this issue. You remember during the, the era when Ronald Reagan was president, he got rid of a lot of those right. mental, mental uh, health facilities. Well, we're having to go back now because we understand that that seems to be one of the major uh, challenges for us in facing homelessness is making sure that we treat people who need that and certainly try to get those that have that have a need to get a, a control of, of their um, you know substance ab uh, abuses or, or, or habits um, that that's going to take some time too for recovery so we have to build out what we call subacute beds and then those that are less that are less acute so that we can get people stabilized and hopefully back out in the community and it's going to take time and not everyone is going to be able to go back right out to the community our hope is to do that but to do it with with qualified clinicians and treatment and with people that can how could i say that even have had lived experience mm -hmm. to help draw people to understand sure. i can empathize with you i understand what you're going through and i want to show you what choices not demand you can't do that but you can say here are choices and believe it or not i think uh we'll be able to to do a better job once we kind of put ourselves in that place where we're listening. And I think that's really critical. And along with what you said, you know, obviously there's a need, there's a need for housing, there's a need for care, et cetera. And one of the opportunities might be sitting, you know, like mm -hmm. right outside of downtown uh, <laughs> with the LA General Hospital. Unfortunately, yes. it was, you know, mm -hmm. it's been in, disrepair damage right. since uh, the Northridge earthquake. Right. I mean, this historic building, it was built in 1934. Right. So I know that you're looking at that and yes. hoping that might, that might be part of the solution if yes. the repairs can be done and mm -hmm. some of the services can be provided there. How's that plan going? Well, it's been, it's been a, uh... A couple of years, I want to say at least three years that I have been excited about looking at it. And this actually came to me through uh, staff, uh, DHS, Department of, of Health Services, uh, folks that were saying, you know, that building sitting there mm -hmm. and it can be repurposed and we can turn it back into something to continue to heal people because it is, I mean, we're talking about many, many acres of of uh, floor space that if we could uh, retool it, put in new elevators, electricity, plumbing, and divide it up into sections so that we could have up to anywhere from maybe five to six to 700 units of housing, wow. single units, uh, two room, two bedroom, and possibly even some three bedroom. But to be able to provide housing for people who need it, mm -hmm. because that's the number one priority. Right now we're short 500,000 housing units that we need to somehow find. Well, why well, you can't build everything, but why not repurpose something like that that could be used? And right now we have set aside money. I'm excited that uh, the state legislature has put in the budget uh, $50 million 
we at the county, through through efforts that I'm working out on with uh, the Recovery Act funding that we're getting from uh, the federal government, we're going to put in about another 44 million, and then we're going to look at coming coming uh, together with developers a public-private partnership to see if developers can come in and bid on an RFP, that's a request for proposal, to see what that vision or vision plan could look like. And then make sure that we're addressing the needs of the population in the area. That would also mean people from LA, Skid Row, women, uh, transitional age youth. It could mean a variety of things for people and I know it would help to lift that spigot, so to speak, so that we could hurriedly address the issue of housing for people who really need it. Would there be a medical component too, perhaps? There could be, yes, because many people will, will need to be, after they come out of, say, treatment, can go into those housing units. So yes, the whole connection is to have what we call a, a restorative care village, one that is wholesome, one that takes care of each other, but a place where people live and work and can understand that this is a place that accepts, accepts you. And I think that's really wonderful. We've already built some uh, recuperative bed. The phase one has already been built. We've already have a unit of 93 uh, housing uh, facility that, that's going to house 93 people, 22 people I think are already in there. And that is for people that aren't severely mentally ill, right. but they have to be, um, they have to be watched, supervised, supervised. Yes. they get meals, they get counseling, they get assistance to get back on their feet, they help, uh, they help to get uh, access to Department of Public Social Services, maybe they need to get a license, maybe they need to get an ID, maybe they need to get enrolled in programs, retraining, education, all of that is being offered at that facility. Then we have another series of beds, about 63, that are, are recuperative care, which is more acute. Those are, those are more, um, how could I say, locked, where you, know, you, really, you really can't be out on, on the street because you might harm yourself. Okay. or you can harm someone else. And we don't have enough of those in the state of California, so we need to work together with the legislature at the federal level to change those laws. I think you would get a lot of agreement in that regard. <laughs> um, but across town, there is another endeavor. It's been about 18 months uh, since mm -hmm. you opened the Hilda Solis Care First mm -hmm. Village. I mean, that's, that's a success oh. story. I think it's a game changer for a lot of people. I, I had no idea that we could transform uh, containers that you see in the ports of LA and Long Beach, those containers that carry shipping goods from across the sea, right? Um, that they could be converted into homes. When I first thought of it, I thought, oh no, that doesn't sound realistic. But when I saw some models of what they could do in Carson, the city of Carson, because they were doing that, they were refurbishing these containers, I thought, you know what? This is, this is acceptable because you can have a unit, you can split the container in half and still have room for a unit, one unit to house one person that would have their own restroom, their own shower, they would be able to take care of themselves. And during the pandemic, I think people really understood you have to isolate. You can't just put everybody in a big congregate setting. And it made sense. But if you were to walk in to one of, our, one of those facilities, um, there's 232 that were built and they're stackable containers. Um, you would say that you were at probably one of the, the nearest nice hotels, motels uh, in town and you'd have access to a Wi-Fi, you'd have your own television, your own refrigerator there, uh, your, your bathroom facilities, bed, a desk, um, and in addition, once you uh, enter into the program where, the, where these units are, you also are entitled to receive your meals there and also entitled to receive wraparound services. So you get mental health counseling, you get assistance. You're also allowed to go work if that's what you, that's what you need at the time to help get yourself back together. And at this facility, which happened to be uh, a parking space that was gonna be used for the Men's Central Jail, they were gonna rebuild the jail, well, since it's in my district, I said, why allow it to just sit there for time when we're not going to build a jail? Let's put some housing, uh, interim housing for, for the unhoused. And we did it in six months. And we did it with uh, CARES Act money that came through the federal government. And we, I, for us, it's, it's unbelievable that it happened in record time. But it took everybody coming together and working shifts, hiring up local people, and then getting a provider in that, was, that staffs it. They even went as far as to put a dog park 
on the property. Aww. You got to see it. It's 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 phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. Is it full? It's full. And we have women from Skid Row, I happen to know that, that are there. We have the provider, the Weingart Center, who actually runs and operates it and has a staffing there. The nice thing about it is that there's a big kitchen there that hasn't been fully opened yet. We had that kitchen built so that we could provide, once we get everything going, because it's not been, it's only been 18 months, yeah. um, is to have a program in there where we could teach the unhoused, those that, want to, those that would want to work in the culinary arts. Mm -hmm. And look at all the restaurants around LA that are, are here around the arts district downtown that are co all coming back. They're gonna need people. And I think we're in a good position with the county and with the city to work together to provide and access those job training dollars to get these people back into, you know, off the street and then out working. And this is your area of expertise, I'm going to have to say, because you were Secretary of Labor. <laughs> okay, but absolutely, but you also have the, the uh, you know, the yeah, boots yeah. on the ground experience mm -hmm. as Secretary of Labor. You understand, I mean, what did you learn from that experience mm -hmm. about the value of, you know, employment and the needs of a person to well, feel relevant if right. they have employment and what are the, how do you distribute that appropriately and help people get into a period of in, uh, independence because of their employment. Right. Well, I think part of it for me goes back to something very basic. It's listening to what the needs are on the ground and what what, what works for one area may not work for another. Sure. So it's, it's going to be a combination of, of how we can collectively bring those resources together and, and form a plan or an, uh, an opportunity for, say, an organization to apply for funding to do, to do the things that they do best. Uh, and maybe that is mentoring and training young, young women, as an example. Uh, maybe they don't want to go to college, but they want to learn skills and to become an entrepreneur. We happen to fund programs like that right now. Uh, and I, I think it's an exciting time for young people while they're going to high school to also learn and be disciplined and show up to work, to, to learn those social skills, to get mentoring and understand what it takes to run a business and understand customer service understand what it means um, and the value of, of the, you know, working and earning your own and being able to help your family out. I've seen some people, their lives completely change when people are just given options and opportunities. It's not a way of masterminding anything because everyone has their different needs, but it's giving people that, that uh, menu of things that they may want to take. So it's teaching young people and people who want to get retrained, because we also have a lot of people who need to be retrained, those are really important things to consider now, and I believe we're in a good position here in Los Angeles County and the city to be able to do that together, to work with the funding that we're getting from the federal government, the state, and with public-private partnerships, because we don't do it alone. The, the business community has to be a big part of that as well. This is a non sequitur, but what was it like being Secretary of Labor? Was yeah. it a... Was it, remarkable in all ways or was it challenging or was it you know because it's a rather prestigious position especially being a woman um, how was that you know it was uh, something that I could have never imagined you know that some one day I would go back and uh, you know back to Washington DC and actually serve uh, for uh, the president of the United States it was an honor obviously mm -hmm. um, but I think for me uh, the challenge was always about how can we improve the lives of people and how do we do it through the Department of Labor, working with other departments, community, and also the private sector and the public sector, as well as uh, people who need our assistance and making sure that we try to hit it right, that we get it right. And that's always the challenge. But uh, for me, it was a, a lifetime uh, opportunity, and I encourage people to, to live out their dreams and don't be, don't be hesitant to seek out and risk because let me tell you something. Somebody told me when I was in high school that I wasn't college material. Oh. Yeah, oh. yeah. And, and of, course, names. of course I just sat back and said, well, let's see about that. Uh, and, and that counselor said, Hilda, why don't you just become like a, an office clerk or a secretary? Oh. A secretary. So here, 40 years later or whatever, I could say, well, maybe he was half right. I became the secretary <laughs> of labor, right? <laughs> Different credentials. <laughs> Have you been able to say, 
you were wrong to this individual. <laughs> That'd be fun. I think, yeah. <laughs> but along those lines, I think that maybe what that has done is that has spurred you to make sure that you champion women because that is something that is definitely part of your makeup. Um, what do you feel you can do to help women? And what, you know, why is this an important um, part of your being to make sure that you elevate women and their voices and what they can do? Well, I think women do things in a very different way. We, we can also be very deliberate in what we want to do and what we believe in. And I think that more women getting elected helps to bring about that change that sometimes is necessary because we're looking at uh, family issues, we're looking at children, we're looking at economic issues, we're looking at uh, housing security, we're looking at everything. And as, as a woman, I think we just bring many times a different perspective. It doesn't mean that we're right or wrong, it just means that it's a different perspective. And take a look at the County Board of Supervisors. This is the first time in over a mm -hmm. hundred and something years that you have five women. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, you know, maybe it wasn't planned deliberately, but they rose to the occasion. Right. Another historic moment. Mm -hmm. um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the arts mm -hmm. because that is definitely another passion of yours. And the, actually, I was surprised that the Department of Arts and Culture here in Los Angeles has literally only been official since 2018, right. which is very strange to me yeah. that the entertainment capital of the planet is only... <laughs> but, but, but how is this important and how does this enhance the civic life and health of you know, the county of Los Angeles? I, I think what it really has, has done for us is focus, have the county focus more on how important arts is to just about everything we do, whether it's employment, getting a job, in the arts area, whether it's working behind a camera, setting the stage, or being the actress or actor, or the script writer, whatever it takes, all of that is it has to do with the economy. So we do need to focus on what that means and training people to get into those jobs. So we have a very diverse county, right? So we want to make sure that opportunities are available, whether it's in any of those uh, segments of the art industry. So that's a big part of what the county should be doing, and I'm happy that we're take, taking up that mantle. We also, for many years, have run different museums I mean, LACMA, the History Museum, these are all things that continue to change and evolve, and they're growing and expanding. And more importantly, through the Arts Department, we're also giving opportunity for young artists and artists that have had a rough time, giving them opportunities to apply for grants, grants of free money, to continue to do what you do best and maybe be a mentor and teach other people how to do that and use that skill in healing. So we're using arts to also heal people. We're doing it with our, our kids that we have in probation. We're also doing it with youngsters who live out in, in poor economic situations. Um, part of what one thing that I, I really like to talk about, I get inspired when I see young kids um, learning how to play different instruments. Probably for the first time in their life, the parents couldn't afford a violin, right. a cello, but they go, they go to school now. They go to certain schools where we offer this in conjunction with the L.A. Phil. It's called YOLA, YOLA. And for the last couple of years that I've been a board member, we've been supporting it. This started before me, but it's expanding now. And when you see these young, young uh, men and women thriving uh, and representing our county, um, it, and it, makes, it just makes my heart, you know, feel so good that you see these youngsters that are going to be professionals that are going into another another fa phase of their life and hopefully a career that's going to sustain them and something that they really enjoy and that we enjoy because right. we enjoy their music. Wow. <laughs> Of course, I'm a huge arts fan. It's the realm of possibility instead of limitation. Mm. I cannot tell you how enjoyable this experience has been for me. Thank you so much. I am delighted that I had a chance to speak to you. Thank and you. if people want to learn more about what you're doing or what your office is doing or just what's happening with the supervisors uh, in Los Angeles County, what's the best way to... They can them? call our offices directly at 213-974-4111 or go to 211. Because if you're unhoused, if you want to know about job opportunities, you want to know a small business, wants to know how I can apply for a grant because I want to expand or I want to start my business, go to 211 and you can get uh, referred there easily. So uh, the county's here to serve and try to do the best we can. All right. Well, Supervisor Solis, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> and that's a wrap on this LA Currents.